and uh, my paper is called The Straight Jacket of Hypermasculinity, A Feminist Perspective Concerning Male on Male Sexual Violence. I'm pretty much just going to read it, but it's not finished, so the conclusion is going to be kind of like a collaborative thing we're all going to like talk about. Um, I have a lot more to say than mine. <coughs> so a recent January 2012 New York Times article titled Men Struggle for Rape Awareness uh, addresses a simple factor um, that our society has been ignoring for decades, that is that men get raped. As this invisible issue gets brought to the public eye, I want to join in the effort to address the most salient features of male sexual victimization. As a victim of sexual violence myself, I have made strides towards giving voice to my experiences so that others who have not yet begun their healing process can understand that they are not alone, so that they too may feel more comfortable to give voice to their experiences. By combining my personal experience with current theories on gender, masculinity, sexual assault, and the institutions that enforce our discourses on these subjects, I've been able to make appeals to other victims, uh, and also educate and promote awareness of those who haven't experienced sexual violence. By means of giving speeches at the university level, I've been able to receive peer feedback and improve my research, work with professors who encourage academic excellence, and work towards a more complete feminist analysis of gender violence. <coughs> Continuing with my research on gendered interpersonal violence, this paper explores how male-on-male -male sexual violence happens in our society. I investigate popular notions of masculinity and how those straight, <coughs> I'm sorry, and how those ill-fitting conceptions play into sexual violence by considering how the straight jacket of masculinity, uh, that is, a restrictive, confining, and impossible standard of maleness, uh, fosters and perpetuates male and male sexual violence. <coughs> I argue that violence is used as a restorative means to express men's uh, masculine identity, and also is used as a reconstitutive or restorative act for regaining a lost sense of masculinity, which many men feel entitled to. Um, when it is impossible for men to perform the outrageous hypermasculinity that American patriarchal society has constructed for us, uh, I believe that men resort to a crude act of partial restoration, that is, men resort to raping other men. My exploration avoids prima facie uh, micro-psychological explanations of sexual violence, and instead I employ feminist analysis of gender that focuses on macro-explanations of male and male sexual violence. <coughs> so, um, in American society, hegemonic masculinity is defined in such a way that what it is to be masculine is virtually unattainable by most men. Um, in a film by Jackson Katz, which I'm sure most of you have seen, titled Tough Guys, young men in a high school hallway define what the essence of masculinity is as strong, physical, independent, intimidating, powerful, strong, again, um, in control, rugged, scary, powerful, again, uh, respected, hard, athletic, let's go on. Um, conversely, these high school kids responded that um, if you don't measure up to the standard of maleness, you are, quote, considered a pussy, bitch, fag, queer, soft, little mama's boy, emotional, girly, windy, weak, and the word fag is used four times to describe what it is to be not masculine. And I thought this was really interesting. Um, Grammy award-winning rap star Eminem helps to explain why this word is so <laughs> commonly used to describe what it is to be not a man. Uh, he states that faggot to me doesn't necessarily mean gay people. Faggot to me just means taking away your manhood. So, according to Eminem, <laughs> who is arguably an expert when it comes to popular notions of masculinity, <laughs> <laughs> in some situations, being described as a faggot simply means not that you are gay, but that you're not a real man. You're not masculine. And while Eminem's claim that the word faggot is not tied to homophobia truly misses the mark, um, his analysis of how othering someone with that word can strike at the heart of what it is to be masculine, as defined by hypermasculinity, is surprisingly accurate, I think. Um, masculinity is in part defined in opposition to femininity, meaning that if you're not masculine, you're feminine. There's not really like a middle ground. Uh, the reason so many of the high school boys Katz interviewed responded that the word fag is used to describe what it is to be non-masculine is because gay and deviant identities have been coded as feminine because femininity is valued so disproportionately low compared to masculinity in our culture. So, while the insult bag is essentially a homophobic moniker, it also contains a feminine gender classification, which is the opposite of masculinity. <coughs> I think another perspective on the restrictive hypermasculine ideal comes from men ages 36 to 75, uh, focusing on the expectation of physical excellence. In Fixing the Broken Male Machine by Nico Lowe, <coughs> masculinity is defined in part by the successful production of an erection, and impotence is linked specifically with being non-masculine, and by non-masculine, feminine is implied, like I was talking about, of course. Um, so, essentially, to be a complete man, you need to be able to summon a rock-hard erection, and if you can't, there's something wrong with your body, and as a result, there's something wrong with your masculinity. So enter Viagra, which is a dose of masculine.
masculinity and the problem of impotency and failure to be masculine has been medicalized. When asked if Viagra was a dose of masculinity, um, so it's really interesting that like a concept like masculinity can be fixed with something physical, like a little pill. Strange. Uh, but when asked if Viagra was a dose of masculinity, Fred, who was an interviewee of Lowe's, responded, I can't argue with that. Without it, you aren't much of anything. And I'm not sure if he's talking about without a boner or without the prescription. I don't know. Um, if you have an impotency problem to any degree, you look for something to help it with, or you abstain completely. If they feel like this is a masculinity problem, I guess they're right. <clears throat> the association between masculinity and the production of an erection is problematic because naturally as one ages, their, bottles, their body's faculties diminish, and having the same strength erection as they once did at, at 20 years old is unrealistic. But on a larger view, this connection between masculinity and physical perfection is a demand that few men can meet, even in young ages. Um, and so I think that that very connection helps build a false masculinity, uh, like a masculine mystique, if you will. Um, so, <laughs> in fact, based on Katz's survey of high school males and Lowe's interview with middle to late aged men about erectile dysfunction, for men of all ages, masculinity is defined by a narrow focus on physical perfection, strength, both physical and emotional, social control, and toughness. And uh, Katz also claims that this is true for all socioeconomic, racial, and ethnic groups, too. Um, he says that at every intersection of race, class, and ethnicity, it's possible to see men performing masculinity in a way that is typical of hegemonic hypermasculinity. So, like, for example, in the media, Latino men are almost always presented as either boxers, criminals, or tough guys in the barrio, and Asian American men are disproportionately portrayed as martial artists and violent criminals. Um, so, like, totally, of course, the media representations of masculinity are not as important or, um, salient as real-life performances of masculinity, I think they're still really valuable to examine because of the reciprocal relationship between life and advertising. <coughs> I have a note here that says read slowly, so. <laughs> 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 kind of like switching gears, talking about anthropology right now a little bit. Um, anthropologist Sian Howell argues that in societies where men can acknowledge fear, uh, levels of violence are really low. Um, but in uh, societies like America's, where the masculine bravado, um, which is kind of uh, defined as um, like normative masculinity that overemphasizes like bellicosity, dominance, posturing, violence, and toughness. Um, levels of violence are very high. So um, anthropologists like Howell and Roy Willis have identified nine themes that seem to lead towards violence in society. Um, and I examine these themes uh, specifically with hypermasculinity in mind. And we can discover um, that American culture satisfies all conditions that lead men to be extremely violent. Um, and this masculinity that I'm focusing on is one that constructs masculinity um, in opposition to femininity, like I spoke before. Um, <coughs> upon this understanding of masculinity, we can understand, I'm sorry, we can begin to see how the construction of hypermasculinity, which is informed in part by patriarchy and exaggerates the differences between men and women, um, is amplified by American culture and it leads to violence. So, I also think that as a means to perform masculinity, that violence is undertaken in a sexual manner. The nine themes that contribute to high levels of interpersonal violence and America's complete fulfillment of them are as follows. <coughs> One, the ideal for manhood is a fierce and handsome warrior. In American culture, hegemonic hypermasculinity is the only valid form of expression of masculinity. Uh, masculinity by any other name doesn't really measure up. Um, this is true because high school kids have been murdered by other high school kids for straying away from normative mas masculine scripts, and hegemonic masculinity is enforced by most um, popular hip-hop music and ar arguably most other forms of media, too. <coughs> Number two, public leadership is associated with male dominance, both of men over men and of men over women, and um, so pretty much patriarchy is the foundation upon which America was built. Men exist in American society in virtually all powerful positions, and women are relegated to an inferior 